My name is Daniela King. I'm an assistant curator here, and welcome to Nottingham Contemporary. I'm very pleased to be introducing our event tonight and our speakers. Uh, it's a very special event, the Nottingham Contemporary, um, where artist Mark Lee Shambich will be in conversation with Michael Bracewell for a walking tour of his installation, Jean Genet, The Courtesy of Objects. This is a unique opportunity to hear firsthand about this major new installation and Mark and Lee's relationship to Jean Genet and his writings. Born in post-war Paris, Mark and Lee lives and works in London and Burgundy. From performances and installations in the 1970s through to the designs for furniture, ceramics and patterns for mass-produced consumer items, Mark Kamishamovic has developed an unmistakable form of idiom and signature style. In what he terms choreographies, Shamovich takes pleasure in breaking down the hierarchy of applied and fine art. He has exhibit, exhibited widely with recent exhibitions in London, New York, Berlin, Amsterdam and Bordeaux. Michael Bracewell is a writer, novelist and cultural commentator, born in London in 1958. He's an alum, alumnus of the University of Nottingham and an author of six novels and two works of non-fiction. He has written widely on contemporary art and pop culture, with a particular interest in Roxy music, in which he has written a number of publications. He writes for Freeze and has contributed to exhibition catalogues for numerous artists. Michael has also written and presented two documentaries for BBC. Uh, this evening, Mark and me and Mark, Michael's conversation in galleries three and four will be um, transmitted live to this screen in the space. After around 45 minutes to an hour, um, they will then continue their discussion uh, and invite questions from the audience downstairs here in the space for around 30 minutes. Um, we imagine this event will last no longer than an hour and a half. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mark Nishamovich and Michael Gracewell upstairs and hope you all enjoy tonight's event. Mark, Camille, uh, I remember during the late 1970s and the early 1980s, the first half of the 1980s, I became incredibly interested in Jean Genet. And he remains this really intensely charged writer. He has the most incredible mythology. He has this ability to talk, it seems, to lots of different generations. I would also have thought he's one of the great myths of European literature. And I was very interested to wonder how you came to put this fantastic exhibition together. It's just, if you could elaborate. Well, it goes back to conversations I've had intermittently with Linda, mm. Linda Morris, who may not be present tonight. <coughs> You, you, you will recall, perhaps, that Linda had invited me to do a show five or six years ago now in Norwich, mm -hmm. which went to the, under the aegis of Jean Cocteau, mm -hmm. <coughs> which was, I guess, a commission. Right. Um, and so we built a fictive portrait of uh -huh. Jean Cocteau for her gallery. She then had the time to write it in Norwich. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, she approached me again with a proposition amounting to a commission mm -hmm. around Jean Genet. Right. Um, and as with yourself, um, I'd been highly taken by his writings, perhaps mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years before you had. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, it was something that I was keen to uh, assess. It proved to be a lot more challenging than yeah. Cocteau. I mean, because of, I think principally because Janet is has so much more uh, gravitas mm. uh, and mm. is, in my mind, dealing largely with the immaterial, yeah. whereas Cocteau is much more of the material world. I mean, this was one of the things that as soon as I came into this exhibition, I remembered something that, this idea that Genet has, it's either at the start of the Thief's Journal or at Our, Our Lady of the Flowers, where he says how he is nothing other than a pretext. And at one point he even describes himself, he says, I am a legend. and 
the seams as you come into this exhibition to be this wonderful sense that one is walking into the sort of interior world of Genet as this mythic figure. I remember Patti Smith once saying that, you know, Genet was this lousy, petty criminal, um, and he just stole a few fancy shirts. But in his head, he lived this life of, you know, he, at, at one point, I think he almost, he says that his surname, Genet, is related to Plantagenet, and so he's related, in fact, to royalty. Um, and that he has this sense of, a, of an interior life that is so regal and opulent and drenched in kind of sensation and so on. Was that what had attracted you? Was it this... Well, his imagination, as you will agree, you no bounds. It's also true that he refers to the tiniest of wildflowers in the French countryside. Mm. Actually, Corda and Jeunet. So it, the the range that he can appropriate is boundless. Mm. Um, it's I mean, um, it's hard to know where to start. I, I guess I identified with him to some extent as a certainly as an art student, and, yeah. and as I was leaving art school, uh, I think my 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 primary uh, drive was that of, a, of the iconoclast. Yeah. And yet, uh, as time develops, so one becomes more aware, I think, of how creatives are inevitably engaged in a degree of continuum. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, the fact that one attempts to place what is, a, I suppose, an example of expanded media into some kind of some kind of art historical context and might enable one to place this within the loosely within the genre of portraiture, ah, perhaps. I love that term you used about your Cocteau exhibition, fictive portrait. Right. That yes. seems absolutely key. Well. We should perhaps wander about the yeah. show, yeah. since we have the technical means to do so. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was where would you like to start? Um, Does it matter where you start? I don't think it matters, really. I, well, I, I'm happy that we start in this room rather than next. Well, I was um, so impressed by the fact that you have this wonderful array of Giacometti's. Um, so maybe we could start just as a place to start with this beautiful... Well, we... we, 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 we we could indeed, and you know, it's mercifully the case that we're not necessarily fully conscious of our decisions, um, and that's just as well because it wasn't until a few weeks after the show had been realized mm. that I became aware of how audacious the project actually is, mm. and how dare one even consider show one's own work in the context of the great late Giacometti. Mm -hmm. uh, but in retrospect, as a result of discussions, notably with Nadine and Alex, um, because of the connection between mm -hmm. Genet and Giacometti, and because we mercifully had the means to actually borrow some of these great bronzes, mm -hmm. so the exhibition took place. And yeah. so we then had this, this curatorial challenge of placing yeah. these bronzes within the context of contemporary yes. practice. Yeah. And only then assessing as to whether or not a late modernist master from the 20th century might actually sit yeah. and achieve a degree of currency within the 21st. Yes. Uh, and it's not for me to say yes. whether or not we've achieved that, but that would be, I think, a criteria for this exhibition yes. project. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you use that very interesting term, fictive portrait, would it be accurate to say that this particular exhibition almost creates a, a ceremonial environment, an imagined ceremonial environment for the young Genet? Is this 
if one could summarize your ambitions with this particular work, is this almost as you would imagine a, a dream interior would be for Genet? I think it's quite possible. Certainly, as you specify, the younger rather than the older. Yeah. Because of the highly aestheticized nature of our invited artists, for example, who have yeah. put the guest list. Um, I don't think there is as much reference to the later, uh, more politicized yeah. uh, writings of Genet. That happens well enough yeah. in the other two galleries. So yeah. I think we've consciously looked at, in a way, the earlier and the later part of his, yeah. of his working life. Yeah. But suddenly the imaginary worlds that he's so richly able to construct yeah. hopefully get some kind of resonance here. Yes. There were three particular things I wanted to ask you about over in this part of the gallery. Um, and the first of them was this absolutely exquisite uh, is it a collage? Yes. Could yes. you tell me a little bit about this? I, I'd never, I've looked at a lot of your work and I couldn't remember having seen anything. And this is really wonderful, I think. Thank you. It's, uh, Nadine and I enjoyed uh, the proposition of a, the first take uh -huh. as one comes into the two galleries. Yeah. Um, principally dealing with the animalistic. Uh -huh. So in that sense, we've chosen this collage above others uh -huh. from the quartets mm -hmm. because there is perhaps a possible link to be made between the, the furs worn by one of these mm. mannequins and uh, the video by a young French artist mm -hmm. that is permanently part of the show. And then, of course, that linking to the dog yes. in the painting yeah. that you see. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this painting, I think, I mean, it's in my simplistic way, I'm sort of imagining the young Genet, both with this painting and with later on the Wolfgang Tillman's photograph, that they're, they're kind of like pin-ups, basically. Yeah, I think I mean, absolutely, and I think also it, it is, it's, uh, it's, I think in that sense it becomes almost a sacred painting, is it not? You know, it's oh, kind yeah. of a devotional painting mm. in that the, the dog is obviously a, a kind of surrogate for the, the love object. Mm. Um, it's a very, I think a very touching painting. Mm. And of course, um, appropriate surely that it should be of a, a scene that's not mm. Western Europe, mm -hmm. but to the edge, mm. as it were, mm. Um, mm. given Chenet was so, such an inveterate mm. traveler, but also a critic of you know, dominant cultures, mm. Mm. notably mm. of colonial mm. cultures. Mm. I mean, it's interesting that I think one of the things you get across in this exhibition is the way that Genet's relationship to the exotic, if you want, to the North African, it begins as intensely romantic and as searching for this kind of wonderful landscape. And one knows that that will become increasingly political. Yeah. But in my opinion, it never became any less romantic. I, I always found the older Genet to be rather misled by politics. Yes. You know, that he was really, he was in love with a culture and with a people. I um, think you're right. He was rather hijacked <coughs> by uh, the political causes, I think. Um, I think it's also that he, to some extent, found his own creative identity uh, very early mm. um, as a conscript, mm. sent to Damascus as a soldier, and then uh, flirting with the foreign legion, mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, deserting. So his, very, his early travels out of France, his first experiences outside of France, outside of the mainland, were in North Africa. Mm. And I think that's where the seeds for his, notably for his romantic attachments, tended to have been sown. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about this wonderful chair and 
shades long. But, I mean, I thought I saw something very similar in the exhibition you had in Vienna. You may have. I mean, you could, you, you could uh, feel free to sit on them if you wish. Um, <laughs> to recline. Yeah. It's, uh, these are quite comfortable. Um, yeah. God, I know. Well, there are... There's a number of readings of this work, <coughs> and notably since the show's session, I think they're increasingly uh, seen as kind of right comment on uh -huh. the legacy of um, the great Sigmund Freud. But uh. the origin was actually a much more painterly, uh. and it was to do with the challenge that I think all painters, and this is what I had initially been trained as, all painters face in the studio, and that is that their conscious mind will tell them that they should sit sort of as I am, but perhaps mm. with a straighter back, a focus on the work in question, mm -hmm. whereas what they truly actually really want to do is to lay down <laughs> and relax with a, probably a gin and tonic and a yeah. magazine and a cigarette. Yeah. Hence this work called Dual, which does purport to offer one that option. Right. So it originated as a an accessory to, yes. the, to the atelier, although it's now, of course, become much more. Mm. Well, it's become it's become something else. Because mm. um, I I rather like to imagine that supposing after the doors are locked, the ghost of young Genet wanders in, that he recline. And directly ahead of him, he has this wonderful. I hope so. And there's yeah. actually has another functional object in the second room, which I, likewise I think can fit into ideas we might have about ah. Janet's nocturnal His practices. Friends. Can I, I? The other thing, obviously, I wanted to ask you about was these, this clothes rack over yes. here. I mean, again, Patty Smith has described Janet as a dandy. Yes. I mean, I, I and I thought. She, that's quite accurate, actually. Um, yes. Even, even the though often... sense. Yeah. That is, yes. And well, this I like seems to think that, that this yeah. coat would conceivably, you know, the, 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 the coat rather than the suits might conceivably have been worn by Monsieur in, in the maids. Uh -huh. um, uh, and then the others, I think, to some extent, deal with the idea of, I suppose, camouflage mm -hmm. um, and the fact that one can, you know, blend to a range of environments yes. and actually dis become invisible. Yes. Um, so this is a, a new way of working for me. Yes. It's, I mean, there's lots of things about this that interest me. One is, I remember, I think when um, Nick Fuchs wrote his biography of the Condorcet, he had this definition of dandyism, that dandyism, as you've just said, was in fact to do with invisibility, which is, of course, what the thief also wants, is to be able to move yes. unseen. Yes. I also wondered whether somewhere in here there's a slight self-portrait of yourself in as much as there is the very smart hat, um, and you often wear a hat. Yes. Um, and I presume that these fabrics are printed from your designs. Yes, yes, and it's a possibility. Um, I wondered if maybe there was a little bit of a reference to your own presence here, or had that not, not really? No, I would not discount that. Uh -huh. It wasn't, you know, consciously the primary motive, right. uh, but it's nonetheless uh, the case that the suits. The majority of these clothes had, at some point, been in my wardrobe. Right, right. Um, yes. And then here's this first Wolfgang, sort of very, very discreet, very powerfully placed here, that's very ambiguous. Beautiful. Beautiful. And you're saying Nadine had been very um, instrumental in helping yeah. with this. Yeah, it was... Uh, important for me to have someone that I could bounce ideas of. Yeah. We had such a, you know, infinite range of options yeah. in terms of what is placed where. We were obviously attempting connections to people. That's, yeah. that would, I would have thought would fall within uh, 
the Aegis and Fortitude, I mean, even the name, the title, I think, mm -hmm. kind of reveals the fact that it's, it's, uh, yes. it's someone close to Wolfgang. Yes. Those cords yes. coming out of a, a pond right. in Berlin. Right. But in my happily deluded sense of uh, <laughs> the world, I like to think of it as maybe one of the boys from the you know, various homes of correction in France. Right, yes. As indeed could be the case of this yeah. black and white photograph. Yeah, yes. Which I think is kind of really ingeniously and interestingly installed. I, having seen Wolfgang's exhibition at the Serpentine yes. um, and been sort of looked at that quite closely, I felt that, you know, how you'd position this particularly alongside your own car rug design, which again I seem to recognize from Vienna. Is yes, this, yes, yeah. this you, you may have seen in Vienna. Yeah. Um, There's a kind of informality about the way you've done it, which again makes Genet feel present here. Hopefully so, this um, and perhaps all the more so um, given the proximity of the bell yes. that is uh, from a museum on this very street that happens to be the museum of the, the National Police oh, Museum. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, so they have a somewhat hybrid collection of right. contentious um, uh, objects. Uh. Uh, this being the executioner's bell. Really? Uh, which was thus used and rung on the mornings of execution. Oh. Um, so oh. of course that's a connection with, notably with our Lady of the, the Flowers. Uh, the Miracle the name of the Rose. The name of the Rose. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Not them, yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, I don't know whether you'll agree, but I, I actually find the Miracle of the Rose a very, quite a difficult book to read. I do. It's somewhat turgid, but I think I would urge anyone to read it right through yeah. to the very end when the, uh, the leading, the protagonist uh, fixates on one of the, on Lead, one of the leading characters who is actually on death row. Yes. And there is a remarkable passage, a few pages from the end of the book, in which <coughs> the only prisoner to be in solitary confinement because he's mm. on a death sentence is also the only prisoner to be held in leg irons mm. uh, and handcuffs. And there's a passage that takes a number of pages in which these objects of uh, contrition just m magically just f drop off him mm. and fall silently onto the ground. Mm. And I deliberated with regard to this exhibition project, with regard to how to attempt to give materiality to the legacy of Cocteau, I mean of Genet. Mm. And uh, I'd thought long and hard about how inherently courteous objects are. Mm. And in rereading this book, as these chains drop, Genet actually writes about the courtesy of objects. Mm. And that kind of obviously mm. confirmed my working title for the exhibition mm -hmm. project. Mm. Hence, uh, I mean, we were offered a lot of material from the museum next door, and we had mm. to be most economic in our choice. And we, we in fact, rejected everything they mm. kindly mm. offered, but hung on to the bell. Mm. Mm. I mean, perhaps partly because there's also Kind of curious connection in terms of materiality with bronze. Yes. Um, Please. Thank you. Yeah. Can you, again, this very beguiling display here of these slides? Oh, yes. Yes. This, is, this interests me. Well, it, I'm, I'm happy it should. It, it quite interests me. It's, I think it has a curiously ambiguous 
statue, I'm not entirely sure yeah. as yet as to what it is, but what I do know is that the visual uh, coda is from a wide range of material that I've recorded mm. over the past year, both in slide film and in video, mm. for what will be quite a long video. Mm -hmm. um, provisionally called times 10. Right. So this is a f kind of trailer yes. for a video that's in the making. I see. Um, which yeah. would be somewhat akin to a kind of road movie. Okay. In that yeah. I began to film in the village in which Jenna had been brought up as a as a kind of fostered orphan right. in, um, in the Montvoy in France. Mm. So I have film material of his, mm. of the environment in which he was raised. Mm. Uh, and then other film material that is ongoing mm. uh, right through to some recordings mm. of his uh, place of rest, mm -hmm. his tombstone in mm -hmm. North Africa. Yeah. So that would be the Um, premise for right. a film which would probably last quite a long time. Yeah. Whereas this film here lasts only seven minutes, 20 seconds. Right, right. So it would be 10 times longer. Yes. Um, yes. And probably yes. the kind of film one would not sit through to watch necessarily. No. No. Um, because all of this part of the exhibition I'm, is all relating to the maid, yes. the, the great play. Yes. Um, and this is a kind of an imagining of a props room. Yes, it is. Yeah. Although items within this space mm. were used in the filming right. of the video uh -huh. that you see here. Uh, so it kind of so there is a connection. From one, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It happens to change uh, form. Right. According to need. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something I, 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 when I saw this exhibition when it opened, I couldn't help feeling that in a lot of ways it, it feels to be a summation of everything that you've done so far as an artist. Well, that's it's kind of interesting. Maybe I was saying to Nadine earlier on, maybe I should stop now <laughs> to retire. Well, that, that's <laughs> one option. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a difficult act to follow, uh, yeah. especially when one has the, you know, the company of these great paintings by yeah. Giovanetti. Yeah. But, um, but I, forgive me, just one thing I felt I had to ask, that there seems to be something in the nature of an awful lot of your work, which is to do with how an individual can create in their domestic surroundings, in their life. They can do what, I mean, Genet uses this word himself when he says about, I dedicate my life to a particular view of myself. And there's a sense in which so much of your work seems to be about turning your immediate personal environment into a shrine which is dedicated to a mythic idea. Is that accurate, do you think? It seems to run, I feel, through so many things you've done. It's quite possible. It's not really for me to say, but I think that we can recall that Jenna did consider the Latin mass as one of the great high points of Western culture. Yeah. So I think in that sense, and that's partly why the Prix Dieu has been designed and built here. Uh -huh. It would be to enable Jenna to actually yes. reconnect with those early days yeah. spent as a choir boy. Yes. In the Bonfant. So I think there is an element. I mean, I'm not yeah. evading your question. I'm mm -hmm. not able to answer it necessarily, but I will acknowledge mm -hmm. that the sacred does play a part yes. so in his practice and hopefully mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. be it obliquely in mind. Because one of the other things that emerges, I think, in Gene is this idea that for the prisoner and for the convict, there is the capacity that the, the implements of crime or even of murder 
go through this act of transubstantiation and they become sacred and holy in a blasphemous way. And this seems in some ways to relate to what you're saying about the courtesy of objects, that this idea of something transforming from one state to the next to enable this kind of rituals of transformation. Mm. Does this sort of chime with your thinking around Genet or? I think very much so. Oh. I mean, could we, I mean, this is so spectacular, this part of the exhibition. I mean, there's firstly a beautiful rug here, but then the, on this wonderful background color, I have to say, the, the Giacometti portrait, it is so powerful. Um, and yet, as you say, very audacious. Did you, did you feel that you were having to go out, take risks to do this? I don't think I'd been fully aware of the, of the implications. You know, when initially chatting with Alex as to what might be possible you know, before mm. mechanisms were put in place to acquire the, the loans. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the full realization of the implications came later. Mm. Um, and I think then we had the complex but really interesting um, negoti choreographic negotiation mm. of what to place where. Mm. And that wasn't always easy. I mean, we had some differences of opinion between ourselves and our way of working and the director of the La Fondation Jacques Committee who has a much more, I think, a much more formalist way of working whereby mm. things tend to be put in place on plans months before, probably mm. in meeting rooms, uh, mm. rather than working in the way, the only way this kind of show can mm -hmm. fall into place, and that is through the fluid trial and error, very mm. pragmatic placing of objects, and with, you know, sleeping on it a few days, and reassessing and changing sending objects back to London. I mean, there's a lot of work that was imported here that mm -hmm. we found superfluous to need, so we pared it right down. Mm -hmm. So all that, I think, can only happen sort of on the ground. I think mm -hmm. partly because we're dealing with such, such a wide range of issues. Mm -hmm. And also, it's quite a wide chronology of work mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the, the origin of the Giacometti's and the video by Mathilde, which was made, you know, like two months, three months ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. But I'm not sure that. I think also, you know, once dealing with <coughs> kind of cultural implications, mm. for example, of a small drawing here, mm -hmm. which is of, of Sartre, so mm. you know, it's not an easy subject to deal with, no. given his mm. position and his legacy. Mm. But it's also been consciously placed there as almost the last thing you see, given you come into this room, you turn around, and as you exit, so you then see mm. that portrait, which becomes yeah. almost... I mean, I've always thought of a Sartre, as, at least to my generation, as, you know, he's unconscious. Mm. Uh, and he's there to kind of remind us of yes. the bigger questions. Yeah. Because you know, he wasn't fluffy. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, Mm. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because I mean the Sartre biography of Genet, the Saint Genet, um, which I confess I've never managed to. I was read. talking to someone working here this afternoon. Who was actually reading it on page fourteen, I think. Fourteen. I wished, fourteen. I, I wished it well. I said, yes, I don't know anyone good. who's read the whole book. No, but um, no. and it's also problematic in that it pretty much yeah. ruined Genet's own it, creative. In, uh, engagement. I mean, he, I think he felt unable to write for a number of years yes. on the publication of that book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Am I right in thinking that he kind of, when that book came out, he almost felt, well, there's just no point writing. And sort of like the more people kind of urged him to... Uh, you know. I think it was, the, in a way, the combination of, a, of, an, of an uneasy feeling anyway, which was 
concomitant with his rapid success in yeah. material terms, yeah. which meant that, I mean, paradoxically perhaps, he was actually, you know, given he'd always been such a marginal, twilight-like figure, yes. uh, he was suddenly in the spotlight. He was a celebrity. Yeah. Uh, suddenly on literary and cultural Parisian scene, mm. that it was as the his cherished sense of alienation. He was alienated from his own sense of alienation. Mm. Um, and I think the Sartre anthem was concomitant yeah. to that feeling of yes. despair, really. I think... I think he spent something like over 10 years not writing. Yes. Primarily engaging in the support of others. Yes. Through his, his friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. And, and one of the reasons, of course, why I think it works that Giacometti should be so present in this show is that mm. we recall that Chenet said that the only mortal he had wholehearted respect for was Giacometti. Mm. Mm. So there is, in a sense, a kind of, mm. I think, a connection. In they're both mm. ultimate. Yes. Kind of existential symbols. Yeah. I mean, now seems a good moment to look at this wonderful yeah. photograph of Giacometti and Chenet. Um, where did you find them? They're from. Uh, they're from also from the from the Giacometti Foundation. Right. Right. From the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of this room, we. This is the. Well, this is the great portrait. That's yeah. from the Pompidou. Um, yes. Did you have any sense in which, as you completed this, that you were in one sense kind of trying to lay a spirit to rest? <laughs> Who's? <laughs> Yours is. I think that um, I think that you know what was great about showing that first video that you see in, on coming into the first of the two galleries mm. is that I'd had a tutorial with Mathilde about six months ago, and she showed me some work, uh -huh. uh, and uh, and I'd asked her out of I'd recommended she read some of the plays mm. of Genet. And two months later, we had another tutorial, and she'd done so. Mm. And she'd become that interested by the work that it had actually generated a new mm. body of work. And I thought this is kind of miraculous mm. that a 25 year old in, nine, in 2011 yeah. should still feel a degree of urgency about yes. a play written by a gay yeah. man in Paris in you know, the 1950s, like 60 years ago. Yeah. So I think in that sense, it'd be almost the opposite. Yes. I think that he's one of these, you know, you were talking of Burroughs earlier on, and I think mm. likewise, Genet is one of, these, one of these rare writers whose legacy is actually, through even as diverse an influence as on people like Bowie, for example, you know, mm. he's, he's actually able to inform new generations. Yeah. Often of people who actually aren't that highly specialized mm. or highly trained, mm. who may come from almost from street culture. Yes. Which of course is no is no accident given no. he was so drawn to street culture yeah. himself. I was always fascinated by I remember once reading a testimony from a mod who uh, was talking about along with the Vesper, he also had a Jean Genet novel. Right. Can you imagine? What else do you need? Exactly, in Harrow in 1963, <laughs> yeah. Harrow, of course, which is where I used to go and see the Who play. Ah. Uh, Harrow on the Hill. God. So it all connects. Yeah, the Railway Tavern. Yes, yes. Yeah. West London. Yes. So, well, I think 
we're going to disappear yes. downwards in yes. a suitably satanic manner, and okay. you're going to take <laughs> some questions from... Well, we are, yeah. Yeah. Um, but thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yeah, I feel we've kind of... We've maybe scratched a little bit of the surface, but with Gene, it seems there's always more, isn't there? There is, yeah. There certainly is. And I think one of the great <laughs> achievements of this exhibition, which, um, as I said to you earlier, this is one of the best things I've seen for such a long time, is that you've managed to preserve a sense of mystery. It's like you haven't... I oh, love the fact that you haven't disclosed. It's, it's still... Wonderful. You haven't tamed your subject. It's still... Well, as I've only ever said, this, 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 this exhibition project was... Um, prompted by the writings of Jean Genet, nothing more. Mm. Yes. I think prompting, I think, is the key. Yeah. Hence his own, I am nothing, I am only a pretext. Yeah, right. Pre the text. Yes. And yeah. There we are. So, right. Below. <laughs> Below. <laughs>